first question for you, actually, it references back to um, the way I've introduced it with it being sort of 1979, where the first edition came out. In your view as a panel, um, how do you think the magazine has evolved over time? And I'll start with you, Marcus. Gosh, uh, <clears throat> I don't think that we really bear much resemblance to the Doctor Who Weekly of 1979. I mean, I loved Doctor Who Weekly in 1979 when I was a kid. It was amazing. It was, you know, it was, uh, it was incredible. I remember the day that the first issue came out and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I think that um, the magazine has grown, has grown older with its readers, I think. And I think really the, the successor to Doctor Who Weekly was more Doctor Who Adventures, really. I think, if anyone remembers that. Um, I think that really inherited um, <clears throat> the format that Des Skin um, created for Doctor Who Weekly. And I think certainly, certainly by the end of the 1980s, certainly by the time John Freeman was the editor in 1988, I think it, Doctor Who magazine had become a magazine by fans for fans, really. Whereas the, the title that Des Skin launched in 1979 was very much... Um, was very much aimed at a younger audience and maybe more casual television viewers of the show, I think. Peter, would you like to add something to that? Uh, well, yes, it's, it's, it's absolutely true what Marcus said. It started off, the majority of its readers were um, kids, basically, like, like me and like you. Uh, um, minimum age, probably about 10. Uh, see Ian K. McLachlan there, hello Ian. He would have been one of the older readers at the time. Uh, um, but but even then, you know, to 20s or 30s, that's about as old as Doctor Who fans would have been, I guess, buying Doctor Who Weekly. Um, and then it evolved from being a comic uh, in the, the 1980s, started to do more and more interviews with the cast and crew in the 1990s when there was no TV show. It mm. really became a magazine of research, um, discovering all the things that, that we ever wanted to know about the series in its formative years. And now I think it's a, a combination of all three. We still try to appeal if we can to the readers who've been with us since that very first issue. But there's also new stuff as well to hopefully appeal to, to newer and younger readers. Plus we're still going ahead and still finding out more stuff um, from even the earliest years of the series. There's still research going on too. I'm looking forward to the new 1965. Um, oh, it's very good. Edition, it's way. very good, there's some good stuff in there. I'm looking forward to that. Um, Tom, I mean, you presided over, over the magazine for 10 years, you'll have seen some changes. Yeah, well, I mean, I was younger than, than the age Peter was just suggesting uh, when the first issue came out, because I was only three years old, but I have very, very uh, strong memories of getting that, and, and I read it with my dad, who was 40, so there you go, a 40-year-old and a three-year-old were, were reading the first few issues of Doctor Who Weekly, and we loved it. Um, yeah, it's, there has been quite a few changes. I mean, um, the, you know, it always had features in it, I suppose, even those early ones. You know, I remember the first one had like a history of the Daleks and, and they did sort of um, story synopsis and things like that. They weren't, they weren't perhaps quite the sort of features that you'd get later on, but it was probably a bit more wordy than, than the sort of the modern kids magazine market, I would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, by the time it went monthly, I mean, that was less than a year in, wasn't it? It was already changing. And I think that was the first big change. The second big change is probably the end of the eighties when it goes off air and it has to adapt. Um, and I suppose the sort of third big change is when it sort of came back again and it kind of tried to, you know, grab all the, 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 the new audience that was there in two, 2005 itself quite a long time ago now. Um, but while retaining everything it's sort of become in those years off. So it's it's generally been a gradual shift. There haven't been sort of too many, you know, even when it went monthly, I think, you know, that was probably quite a big change, but you know, it was, it was still, it's like the comic and it's still, you know, already had features and things. So I don't know if it's, if, if it's ever changed from one issue to the next, you know, completely, you know, uh, starkly. It's, 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 it's the readers have kind of gone with it as it's, as it's changed. I think it has to be said that Doctor Who Weekly was not, although it's a very strange hybrid of comic and features, which of course Doctor Who magazine still is. You know, I can't think of another magazine that has a comic strip in it. Um, not, not to that extent anyway. I mean, Des didn't actually create that format for Doctor Who Weekly. The format was created for Hammer Films, for, um, for the Hammer Films magazine. And I think it worked rather better for Hammer than it did for Doctor Who because the Hammer magazine ran for about three years, I think, four years. But as Thomas just pointed out, 
Doctor Who magazine in its weekly format was relatively short lived and it went monthly because I think it had to. Because although it had a very, very strong start, it couldn't sustain it. Mm. I think it was very early on that Paul Neary, I think it was, um, at Marvel Comics realized that the, that the readership, that the natural constituency for this magazine was actually older than what Des was aiming for. I think, and there was this there was this process of realization. I think over the course of probably about ten years, certainly from about nineteen eighty, certainly by the time John Freeman arrives in eighty eight, there's a complete acceptance that this is for older fans. And I think that the the, the feature material in Doctor Who Weekly, um, certainly certainly the interviews um, were there, <clears throat> um, kind of despite Des not because of him. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, but I don't think he ever had any enthusiasm for running interviews in Doctor Who. I'm, I'm trying to remember, um, there, there certainly, it certainly wasn't a regular thing. I mean, I've had occasional things that, I, I seem to remember quite early on, it might have been just just after it had gone monthly, there was a thing with John Nathan Turner, the producer at the time, and um, that, was, that was quite a watershed moment because you know it felt like it was something which was actually you know properly about the making of the show and you know oh. even it, it launched in mm. um uh, sort of destiny of the daleks time city of death wasn't it but it didn't really have an awful lot about the current episodes in there that was that was the interesting thing no i think he i, I don't think he had the support that he needed from the bbc photo library perhaps in particular you know there was a big problem getting um he's, he's always told me there was a big problem getting stills in the BBC. But I think if you look at, um, going back to the question you asked right at the beginning of this, um, go, going back to the things that we now consider part of the magazine's DNA, I think the only, the only real part of the magazine that still survives from that era is probably the strip, which is not to take anything away from Des, because Des is absolutely brilliant. And Doctor Who Weekly was a very, very good idea. But as he himself said to me once, yes, it was a good idea, but good ideas were easy then. Emily, you're going to make us all feel very old now when I ask you, what was your very first edition of uh, Doctor Who magazine that you bought? <laughs> well, I wasn't there in 1979 for the first issue of Doctor Who Weekly. Um, I actually started on Doctor Who Adventures and I did very much enjoy that magazine, but after a few years did start to outgrow it. Um, and I remember my very first Doctor Who magazine was actually one of the specials. It was the Doctor Who companion for series one, which I'd found a couple of years after it had been published in a WH Smith. And I remember my dad finding it and saying, look at this, have you seen this? And as a relatively new young Doctor Who fan, it was just wanting to absorb as much of the show as I could. It was the most exciting magazine I had ever seen because I really, really liked Andrew Pixley's stuff. <laughs> I just poured over it because I wanted to find out as much about not just the show in a fictional sense, but in terms of how it was made and the behind the scenes. And that Doctor Who companion did it brilliantly. So that was my very first Doctor Who magazine publication, I suppose. And then after that, Grandma bought me a subscription <laughs> and I've had it ever since. Thank you. Thank, thank the Lord for subscriptions, particularly in these times. Well, um, and grandparents that fund expensive hobbies. <laughs> you've, we've alluded to the fact that the, the, the sort of format has, has changed as, as we've come through, but you, you know, it's charted through some really difficult um, periods. You've already said the show's coming off the air, the wilderness years. Um, you know, you've had to transit into sort of new series who, how, how difficult is it to keep a format like this fresh and um, relevant to what, to, to what the reader wants? Uh, <clears throat> I started on the magazine in 1989, which was around the time it was, the show was ending, obviously, and then I became co-editor with Gary Russell for a couple of years from 93, and the, the question you just asked is one that I guess that I get asked quite a lot. And uh, I'm always slightly sort of um, baffled about it, really, because for us, it was not a difficult time at all. It was absolutely fantastic. We were able to produce a magazine without the complications of having to try to get exclusives about the new series, without having to get material approved by John Nathan Turner, which... Um, which John Freeman, you know, well, I think John Freeman occasionally had a hard time with. And so 
from my own point of view, you know, I, I felt like a kid in a sweet shop, really. Yes, of course, the circulation had gone down and had gone right down, but we were still selling more than enough to, to sustain the magazine. And we could just do, it felt as though we could just do whatever we wanted. And the other thing that people say that, um, you know, how difficult was it to sustain the mag in the 90s when there was no new Doctor Who? I mean, my, my definition of new Doctor Who is Doctor Who that you haven't seen. And so at this point, the, the, uh, the VHS releases were happening. And so you were getting a new story on VHS every month. And many of them I hadn't actually seen. And I think that applied to a lot of our readers as well. And so we use the VHS releases as the tent poles, really. And so it felt as though we had new Doctor Who. And, and certainly my, uh, and certainly I think John Freeman would, would agree with this, um, and Gary Russell as well, probably. It felt as though it was easy for them to actually steer the ship without having to run everything past John Nathan Turner. So, um, I yeah. think it's probably worth adding, Mark. Well, it wasn't difficult at all. Yeah, it's, it wasn't just the stories which a lot of the, the readers hadn't seen. A lot of the photos had never been seen before. And, and, and uh, a lot yeah. of the people who made the show, cast and crew, had never been spoken to before. And I yeah. do think these archives hadn't started by that stage. So there was this yeah. huge wealth of information to be discovered. And DWM suddenly became the, the premier research tool for old Doctor Who fans. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. it started month after month giving you new information on stuff which you'd loved all your life, but only really had the target book as reference for. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think the readers felt it was stale because they stayed with it. I mean, I left the magazine in 95. And um, I mean, Gary Gillett, who became the editor uh, in the late 90s, might have a different view on this because I'd imagine by the time the TV movie turned up, he was probably desperate for some content by then because by that time there had been, what, 15 years, I guess, did not there? No, sorry, you know what I'm talking about? Seven years of, um, of this research-based approach. And then, of course, after the TV movie, there was another drought, wasn't there? And so, you know, I think the people running the magazine at that time may have a different view from me. But, I mean, certainly from my point of view, when I was my original stint to the magazine in the early 90s, it, it was just fantastic. There was just, you know, it was a case of uh, how do we squeeze all this stuff in? Yeah, Tom, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah. It's interesting because I, I, I was at the other end of that sort of drought, if you like, because I, I started on the magazine 2003. So I had um, a good couple of years or so we had before, before the series returned. Um, and we knew it was on its way, of course. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a very much, it was a very exciting time. But it was interesting because that was the time when all of the archives had been done by that point, And there had already been a long, long period by then, as you say, covering all of that stuff so it was um I certainly didn't think I was going to be staying that long on the magazine probably I thought you know if I did stay for a, a couple of years or so that might be that might have been as long as the magazine had left quite frankly at that point um had it not been for the announcement of the return um but you know it was always sort of very exciting to have both of those things past and present I think you know that that uh um, because like, you know, even when the series is on air, as, as of course Mar Marcus will know only too well, there are huge long periods in between when it's not on air. Actually, um, you know, there are months that go by when it's not. So um, you know, it's not like the magazine I work on now, Inside Soap, where the soaps are literally on every night of the week. You know, you have to um, you have to be generating content for, for for months and months when when there aren't new episodes. So. Um, you know the, the 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 trick that DWM's always done very very well is is um, going into more detail than you can ever find anywhere else, um, and and just finding new new approaches and new angles. So um, for me, I, I'd be really interested in getting a, a view as to how long a, a, an edition of of the magazine takes to come together. What's involved in the process, and where does all that start? Per edition, um, who'd like to take that answer? You, Mark. Tom, Tom, what's the what what's the quickest you ever put an issue together? Tom? Um, well, it, when when's your start point? I mean, you can you can say when the end point is because it, it's when you when it finally goes off and and the PDFs are at the printers and they print it. But the start point um, could be months and months ahead um, because you know you're always having ideas for things ahead. So of course it all overlaps. Um, you know, it, it's uh, my approach 
was was to at least have one or two things that I kind of knew were were you know reliable things that would definitely be going in and then there'd be things which were a bit more in flux but in terms of like you know because there are always specials and bookazines and graphic novels and all of that you would sometimes find that you've you've just sent a special and a graphic novel off and you've only got about a week left to do the whole the whole regular magazine <laughs> by that point, rather than the four that you would i you know it, it ideally have Which so that's done actually for the latest issue yeah, so. <laughs> so it really it really depends on your perspective that you know you have the, the intense period where you're really where you're, where you're really putting it together which could be as short as a, you know a week um if, if you're if you're really up against it um but the long longer gestation period is obviously a lot a lot longer than that so i'm assuming mm. you've got linear i'm assuming you've got additions that are working in parallel to one another so you might have one edition at commissioning you may have another at content deadlines that kind of thing is it is it is it sort of linear or is it is it staggered it's fairly it's fairly linear actually i mean we have to create the bookazines and the special editions in parallel with the um with the regular issues but you've got to bear in mind i mean we're doing 19 issues a year in total and so there's very little time to bank material there's there's, ne there's never as much time as we'd like to to do more planning because you're just constantly doing one magazine or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, um, we've got a new um, uh, bookazine out today, 1965 bookazine, which yeah. I think I have behind me. Which I'm really looking forward to. Not the Beano. <laughs> <laughs> this, and there is an article in here that, that includes um, some never before, a bunch of never before seen images from Galaxy 4. And uh, it's an article that I've written myself. And we have had these images probably, I think for nine years. And I've actually been waiting for uh, an excuse uh, for a reason to actually run them. It's because it's a 1965 book, uh, bookazine with a perfect opportunity. So that was kind of, that was nine years in the making, I suppose, in, in one respect. Mm. But that is, you know, that is an a very extreme example. I mean, I think other, otherwise it, it's more a case of, I mean, we, we're literally starting a new issue today and we've got about three and a bit weeks to, to make it. So we'll have, we'll, we'll know there are certain bits of furniture which will have to be there. So we know we've got a front cover, we know we've got a set amount of ads, we know we're gonna have the news page and the letters page and coming soon and reviews, and then we just need to work out what we're going to fill the other 60 pages or whatever with, you know, so. Um, and so it's Marcus's, Marcus chiefly, or before that would have been Tom, deciding what the, the main focus of the mag would be. Uh, and then we talked about between us about who can write what, how many pages to allocate to each feature. And then between us, we, we just make sure that things get done in time. And then Emily comes on board uh, as well, helping to, to look through all the features as they come in and with proofing and seeing how the design works. And then it's, it's towards the end, it's mainly our designers, um, Perry Godbold, who's our art editor, and Mike Jones, who's uh, the, the other designer who works with her, who have the brunt of the hard work, working all hours of the day to make sure that we hit the deadlines and to make the mag look as good as it does or as good as it can. Yeah, we, we, we sent the last issue to press at three o'clock this morning. At what time, sorry? Three o'clock this morning. Wow. That's, publishing. I, That's publishing. I think me and Peter both get up and start working quite early. So sometimes I think DWM is nearly running 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do the 5 a.m. through to, to late as we can stay up shift and then Marcus mm. does the all-nighters. <laughs> and Perry, Perry, Perry as well. Perry, 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 Perry's oh, another yeah. night owl. Yeah. yeah. I hope I hope they buy you pizza for this, Emily. <laughs> well, not well, in at the moment. <laughs> at, at the moment, we're all working entirely remotely. Oh, okay. we, we, we work remotely. I mean, uh, quite a lot anyway. But at the moment, it's entirely remote. I don't. I've, actually, I've not been in the same room as Emily and Peter since when? Must be. Well, I don't know. Isn't it probably? I think Over a year. I think we met in really London about a year it's ago. Sad, yeah. It's sad, isn't it? Because I was going to say, I remember um, when we did have those sort of late late nights, um, <coughs> you know, in the office. And obviously, if we were all in Tunbridge Wells, um, I don't think there were many times it would be quite as late as three o'clock. So, you know, we did have to get home, you know, at, mm. Um, mm. You know when travel is involved. But um, but actually having the pizza and and being there in the office sort of a bit late when when the other magazines had gone was I remember now I remember it quite fondly. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> I just remember the hour and a half drive 
back at one o'clock yeah, in the morning. That, 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 mm. My heart went out to you, Peter. You know, I, I had to <laughs> walk back home um, when I had my flat there in, in Tunbridge Wells. But yeah, it's um, it's it, that, that is interesting because, of course, yes, the, the, the way the magazine was done in my time has, you know, it has changed quite a bit. I mean, Peter and Emily will be able to, to say, you know, how it's changed and, and the, the pros and cons of the different approaches really but um, we definitely all used to go out a lot you know at lunch times and we go yeah. to the coffee shop and we'd, we'd you know have our ideas and, and chat together and I've always found that really really um, in some ways some of the most productive stuff which just came sort of out of chats that we'd have when we weren't officially working we were just sitting there in Starbucks or you know across the coffee or wherever. Yeah. Um, well, we, don't, we do still talk to each other, fortunately, Tom. I mean, I speak to Marcus yeah. and Emily most days, and we have regular Zoom meetings as well. So, oh, I think I think I'm on the phone to Peter probably four or five times a day. Really. Oh, yeah. So I, I think I think <laughs> culture, the working culture of journalism has changed radically. I mean, when I started, um, when I started on the magazine staff in '93, there was still I mean, the office was literally around the corner from Fleet Street. And this, this, is, this, this was the era of, of the four-hour liquid lunch, and uh, and we would get we would get quite a lot of the writers in, etc. And so we would, you know, we would plan a lot of the magazine out in in the pub. I'm not saying we were drunk or anything, but it was just it was a social thing. But but yeah, Tom's right. I mean, it was a very productive atmosphere. But I don't know whether that certainly. I mean, there wasn't much of there wasn't much of the old Fleet Street left, even then by the early '90s. And of course, it's all gone now. Um, but yeah, I do miss that um, culture really, and it's. Um, I do find that sometimes, <clears throat> you know, when I suggest to some of the magazine's younger writers, you know, well, why don't we just go out for a drink and see what happens? They look at you like, you know, do what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just the idea of actually putting something together in the pub. They're probably right, and I'm probably wrong, you know. But it's just. I mean, that's that's how it was done back in the day. Um, Certainly, you know, with um, with me and, and Paul Neary and some of the other guys at Marvel, not with Gary Russell, who's teetotal. But, um, you know, certainly around that time, and I've got fond memories of that, but it does feel like an awfully long time ago. But the whole, you know, the whole world has gone to remote learning, especially in the last, you know, remote working, especially in the last year, isn't it? And uh, yeah, we have lost something really. So hopefully we can get back to something a bit more social soon. Because, you know, I think it's... Um, um, as well as being fun, I actually think it's it, it's actually good for ideas, as Tom said. You know, yes. it's good for the magazine. I mean, obviously, it's changed a lot. We've talked a little bit about how it's changed. Where can it go in the future? What what does the future hold for something like a a, a print magazine now in in its current form? Um. Are you well? I, I don't know. Okay, um, I don't believe it's a binary decision between sort of print and digital. But then again, that just could be because of my age, really. I mean, I subscribe to a number of magazines, and I enjoy reading magazines, and um, <clears throat> and um, I, I hope it will always survive as a print magazine. Um, right. <laughs> readers who are in there. Um, 40s and over and I think that's what they want as well um, I'm conscious that people in their 20s and 30s probably aren't in the same magazine buying habit but I'm not sure that they form a significant part of this magazine's constituency anyway where's your view on it Emily well I am of a generation where we don't tend to have much physical media or even like it because it's clutter you know if you can have it as a, a digital thing then why wouldn't you and that that is kind of the mindset um of my generation however Doctor Who magazine I do see slightly differently I, I still like to get a physical Doctor Who magazine and I do think that a lot of other Doctor Who fans who are younger and of the kind of digital generation do still enjoy having physical media. They love, like, we, we love holding the Blu-ray box sets and <laughs> having the DVDs and, and the books and everything as a physical product. And I, I'm not saying this is just unique to Doctor Who and Doctor Who fans, but it does tend to be something that 
younger Doctor Who fans do still enjoy. So I think in short, I'm saying there is still hope. <laughs> I think younger fans will still be invested in these physical products. And I I could go to digital with Doctor Who magazine and, and not have the physical copy come through my door every month, but I love it. Um, and I love holding it and flicking through it. So I, I think there is still a market for it, even if the general trend in magazines is kind of moving to di- digital. Doctor Who magazine is special. Yeah, I think Emily's absolutely right there. Is in, in a similar way with music, whereas you can you can listen to anything virtually you know, on YouTube or Spotify or any of the streaming things. There, you, you will still get a big market for vinyl and a dedicated market for vinyl because people love a good quality physical product. In exactly the same way that Doctor Who magazine is a good quality physical product that, that, that people may have been collecting for years or maybe have only just discovered, but suddenly it's actually a physical presence. And uh, so um, uh, the, the, the other physical Doctor Who media like the Blu-rays also sell extremely well at a time when in general the Blu-ray market and the DVD market is disappearing again because of, of streaming things like Netflix and Amazon Prime. So I think Doctor Who fans do like physical media and I think it, it, it's hopeful for the future of the mag as a, as a print publication still. Although as Marcus said, will we still do a digital edition as well for those who prefer to, to consume their media that way? I, I think it's interesting because I, I work in print as well and uh, a lot of the of the of the of the main mainstream businesses out there are now switching back to print. So it's an interesting switch. They were switching away five, ten years ago, and they're now actually switching back in their droves. So actually, the catalogs and, and brochures are actually coming back in trend. So I personally think there's a great future for print. It's it's, it's interesting. Um, print generally, uh, you know, the, the, the industry. It's, it's an industry which um, it ha- is contracting and has has contracted over um, the last decade or so um you only have to look at, at abc figures generally for for, for magazines and, and indeed newspapers um i think what's interesting is you you do what what's you know you find the unique selling point you know you find the the thing that only print can do so this isn't just something that applies to doc two magazine but i think doc two magazine is a good example um you you focus on a, an audience um, that you already have and really make the most out of it. Um, it, it. It's slightly counterintuitive, I think. I mean, this is my opinion and others may disagree on this, but I think often in business, you know, it's, it's always talked about, you know, expanding your market and, ex- and your customer base and all of that. Um, it's very, very hard to do that with, uh, with print media at the moment. And actually it's far, I think it's probably a far better approach to really consolidate what you've got and make sure you hold on to as many of those readers as you've got. You know, the magazine I work on now, Inside Soap, um, has has uh, had a format which has been very rigid and very robust for a long, long time, and it, they will not change it because any change potentially drives readers away far more likely than it will attract new ones. Um, it, I know this sounds a bit pessimistic and a bit sort of negative looking, but you have to be realistic about this in any in any business so um funnily enough i think magazines like inside soap and doctor Who magazine will at the end of the day be the last ones still standing because they do have that fan support and that is very very loyal and that's the most valuable thing you can have right now loyalty mm-hmm.